Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. As I just want to sort of fly around here the NBA landscape after the NBA draft because there were a lot of supplemental moves that went down that sort of got caught up in the madness of everything else that was going on. So I want to dive into just sort of a little bit of housekeeping, you could call it. And we'll start with the course 2024 run-ups runner-ups that is in the Dallas Mavericks who this morning agreed to a trade with the Detroit Pistons that I was actually a fan of they moved Tim Hardaway Jr. and three second round picks in exchange for Quentin Grimes Grimes of course spent uh his first couple seasons with the Knicks was moved in that Bogdanovich and Burks trade at the deadline and Grimes is a very solid player and one that I think can fit into what the Mavericks need. They just need a couple more supplementary pieces that they feel like they can actually have some level of offensive production and be able to knock down open three pointers. Now, once Grimes went to uh, Detroit, the, efficiency fell off drastically. He's a career 37% shooter from three last year in the uh, games that he played with Detroit, which granted were limited. He only shot about 17% from three or 14% that is from three. So I would imagine it's, you know, going to be a bounce back. He shot 36% with the Knicks when he was there for a much larger sample size in 45 games. So I like this pickup for the Mavericks where, you know, Tim Hardaway Jr. was set to make $16 million this coming season and was pretty much not not playable for the Mavericks through the second half of the season including the playoffs other than whatever it was one big third quarter or something that he had in that Thunder series but I like this move for the Mavericks obviously have more pieces to come here but a little bit of a solid pickup here that isn't going to get all too much attention We also saw a couple other of these sort of small trades take place right before the second round. Yesterday, the Rockets acquired A.J. Griffin in a deal with the Atlanta Hawks. They traded the 44th pick. The Hawks ended up trading that to the Heat where they used to take Larson. So the Hawks got some future, you know, second round draft capital. Sold very low on Griffin, who was the 16th overall pick in 2022. I suppose the Hawks needed to make some room for Risa Shea and unloading a wing was the way to do so, but it was just a very low price and I like it a lot for the Rockets of just, you know, adding a, adding shooters always help and, you know, that's one area in Griffin's game that has always been prevalent is the fact that he is a reliable shot maker and, he was a top recruit coming out of high school as well. So I feel like this is a pretty nice spot for the Rockets to just sort of slide in. And A.J. Griffin is easily worth more than the 44th overall pick. So that was a no-brainer for them. I love that move. Um, talked about it a number of times already. Just stick with what you're doing, Rockets. Don't don't get stupid on me and end up uh, trading for Kevin Durant. But that's its own thing. And we saw another sort of similar deal. The Raptors acquired Davian Mitchell and Sasha Vizankov from the Kings in exchange for Jalen McDaniels. This is another recent first round selection on the move. Mitchell was drafted a couple years ago, ninth overall by the Kings. And this past season, he saw his playing time really dip off to just 15 minutes per game. Just never necessarily worked out with the Kings. Obviously, he was buried a little bit to some degree when he was behind De'Aaron Fox, but he just never found a role for himself. And this is a situation where the Kings are kind of doing a similar thing to what the Hawks did. And they're just trying to clear out some room in that backcourt for their newest draft pick in Devin Carter. And I like Carter more than I do Mitchell. I was never necessarily huge on him. You know, he was good at Baylor, but with his size, I wasn't really sure how it was going to play at the next level, and that's absolutely a concern you can say about Devin Carter as well. 
So he is not a lock by any means to be this massive con- massive contributor, but I still feel good about the move, Mitchell, plus the fact that you actually get a player that like could potentially be something for you in Jalen McDaniels being a lengthy defender, not to be confused with Jaden McD- McDaniels, but it, it is it is his brother who plays a pretty similar style in my eyes, has a, you know, a lengthy frame as well, so I think it just makes sense. Um, A little bit on both ends. Now, the Raptors side is where it gets interesting because we also have news that this morning the Raptors signed point guard Emmanuel Quickly to a five-year contract extension worth $175 million. And they have a lot of guards to balance in all of this where they have Quickly, like we mentioned, just traded for Davion Mitchell. Gary Trent Jr. was the starter for them last year. He opted into his player option for this upcoming season. And now in the past two drafts, they have added Jacoby Walter, Jamal Shedd, and Grady Dick. Dick is sort of a guard slash forward, but still in the guard you know, conversation. And that's a lot of people to try and balance there. And, you know, Shed was also a late second rounder. I like him a lot. There are definitely concerns with him being an NBA player, so maybe that is something that you just sort of have to let be. Maybe one of them gets moved. Maybe it's Gary Trent who, I mean, that would be a pretty good player as well now that I think about it for the Dallas Mavericks just in terms of being able to bring a three-point shot isn't all too expensive. Maybe I would have liked that one a little bit more if they went um, expiring contract for expiring contract, but just upgrading with Gary Trent over t- uh, over Tim Hardaway Jr. But, you know, regardless, he's still going to be available. And I don't even think for the Raptors, who are this rebuilding team, I wouldn't be overly concerned about the amount of guards. I mean, I don't love it for sure, but I can get over it because there are still probably moves to be made and they're just a young team trying to figure out their place, whatever. They do have a lot of very expensive contracts from on the books now where it's $45 million per year to Scotty Barnes minimum through he just signed a contract extension earlier this week that could reach $55 million per year if he were to make an all NBA team in some of the coming years. $35 million for Emmanuel quickly now for the foreseeable future. And they still have RJ Barrett under contract for 25 to $30 million over the course of the next th- two, three years. I think it's three years. Um, it's a lot of money to have wrapped up in some players that I would, I don't think I can point to any one of them and say that it is a great deal. Now, I fully supported the Scotty Barnes extension, and I do still feel that way. $45 million a year is a lot, for sure, but at the same time, you know, the Raptors are in this situation where they understand they are they're a rebuilding team trying to find their way that money doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to them because it's not like they're this free agent destination so you spend it but it's just a lot of money to have wrapped up in three players that i don't know how great you can feel about any of them um they're just playing very loose with that philosophy of having money to burn but um again I understand that they're they're a ways away from contention anyways, so they probably you know work things out by the time they actually have to. Uh, last couple pieces of news here: the Nuggets traded Reggie Jackson to the Hornets during the first round of the draft. They made up some of the second round draft capital that they gave away to when they moved up to take homes in the first round. This just gives them, again, a little bit of future draft capital, but more than anything, flexibility in terms of this summer, especially with Contavious Caldwell-Pope, who just the other day declined his player option and is going to be a free agent. Now, KCP is a massive piece of this Nuggets team. He was a really big part of the Lakers in 2020, just one of the best, most applicable role players that any team could ask for, so... I'm sure that's going to be a top priority for them. And the final piece of news that we got today was the Golden State Warriors deciding to pick up the player option of Chris Paul. Today was the deadline, and they are officially doing so. It's going to be a $30 million expiring contract, and I would imagine they're going to try and use that 
to make a deal with another team and send him out to upgrade for a better player. I was looking at some of the contracts in the NBA for this upcoming season and some players that just kind of stood out of like, could they possibly get moved? Jeremy Grant of the Trailblazers, Chris Middleton of the Bucks, of course. Again, I just mentioned it earlier. Kind of doubt that's the case, but just some something that stood out to me. I wouldn't say that Middleton is an untouchable. DeAndre Ayton, CJ McCollum, Tyler Hero. I understand that none of those names are super exciting. I, it could maybe interest you in a Julius Randle, who's at $29 million. I don't think the Knicks are going to trade him and what are they even going to get from the Warriors in exchange for that Brandon Ingram is at 36 million dollars so I don't know if they could maybe make something happen there obviously second luxury tax does put some handicaps on the moves that the Warriors are able to make and then you know generally speaking here some of the names are better than others you know I wouldn't mind seeing Jeremy Grant there but it is I don't know how many of them necessarily fully move the needle for the Warriors in terms of being automatic contenders. I do maybe like the idea of Jeremy Grant trying to slide in a deal there. If I were to, again, and I don't have all the details, I don't have the trade machine fired up or anything, but if they made a deal for Jeremy Grant, let's call it a Chris Paul, something along the lines of, you know, I mean, I honestly don't even know. Chris Paul is obviously the lesser asset, but it's not like Jeremy Grant on that contract is super tantalizing, but maybe they go out and like if they were to get a Jeremy Grant and then if they were to make a second deal with the Cleveland Cavaliers, who I've long been talking about, I would love Jared Allen on the Warriors. He's at $20 million, so I don't think that the Chris Paul and Allen contracts are going to match up, but they could find some sort of way to work out a deal with Cleveland, sending them Andrew Wiggins, maybe some draft capitals, maybe some young players. I feel like you could end up in a pretty decent spot there. I don't know if you're something along the lines of Curry, Brandon Pajemski, Jeremy Grant, Draymond Green, and Jared Allen. Now, spacing is a little bit of an issue there. But again, this is sort of an on-the-fly rebuild for the Warriors. I'm just saying maybe they have some options. Um, Chris Paul is going to be traded for sure. I would have to imagine that they're not going to bring him back for $30 million. Giving him to a team like the Trailblazers, which can just buy him out and you know they pick up some extra assets, would probably be beneficial for them. I don't imagine that a team that is actively trying to compete is going to take on a $30 million deal, but we'll see. Just want, curious as to what what are the Warriors actually trying to do here? Are you serious about maximizing the rest of Steph Curry's career in Golden State? Or are you just going to sort of play around with just having him being a competitive team for the rest of the years and having him retire a Warrior? Both are definitely on the table. I'm not super tantalized by that idea of just sort of playing the string out. But, you know, we'll see. And for Warriors fans, I understand it's been very fun seeing the development of these young pieces, but at the same time, you know, you can't you can't have everything. You either are contending, we saw and Warriors fans should know that better than anybody in terms of seeing the two timelines and now it kind of worked in 2022, but I would argue that the majority of that championship was based off of the more veteran pieces they had and Steph Curry maybe with a little splash of Jordan Poole, but let me know what you think in the comments section again. I know I just threw out a lot of different topics there, but had again, had to do a little bit of housekeeping before we head into the weekend here. And, you know, there were a number of things that sort of got swept under the rug. But that is all the time we have for today. Thank you very much for tuning into the GSMC Sports Podcast. Thank you to the GSMC Sports Network for allowing us to host this show. Remember to like, follow, subscribe wherever you keep up with us. Be sure to check us out on social media as well for more exclusive short content. But have yourselves a great weekend. We will be back Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Take care, and we will see you then. Let's go.
can put a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. Yeah, I'm tired of shit, and the coffee ain't hit yet. Damn, ain't that great? I don't wanna go.